As we begin, let's understand that the first Great Awakening was a precursor, obviously, to the second, and the second Great Awakening occurred almost exactly 100 years after the first. The first Great Awakening, which is between 1730 and into the 1740s, is something that is formational for what we are going to be calling later on the United States. And notice it says the first Great Awakening in America, right? The American Great Awakening. And that's because it does actually begin in Europe, in England. But the other thing is, is it kind of signifies the, this moment of change in the colonies, where the, the people of the colonies begin to think of themselves a little bit differently than the people of England. They, they see themselves still as English colonists and as, um, as loyal to the king. But what they begin to realize is their customs, those things that, that are kind of considered normal within the colonies, are not the things that are perhaps normal back in England. The customs have changed. The language has changed somewhat. And this particular event is going to be formational then in preparing the colonists for the American Revolution. So the first question is, well, what was it? What was the Great Awakening? This is a religious revival. And, and again, what's important is not so much the, the date, but that you see that it is pre-revolutionary. It is before the American Revolution. And so we want to kind of understand how this ultimately is going to influence the revolution. So when we say it's, it's a religious revival, one of the things that I want to kind of say up front is that an awful lot of this content is going to be religious. We can't avoid that. Uh, one of the things about studying history is that we study economics, we study geography, we study politics, and of course we study religion, societal norms ways of thinking and things like that. And so I'm going to try and avoid some of the deeper theological ideas here, but at the same time, there's, going to, there's some theological content to this that perhaps some of people won't agree with. I understand that. But remember, this is looking back in time at a particular historical period, and what we need to do is we need to kind of put on their glasses and see it from their perspective at that time, how things were different. So let's focus on this word revival at first. It implies that during this time, people were religious, or prior to this time, people were religious. But during this time, there was a, a sudden sort of awakening. And that's why it's referred to as the Great Awakening. People were religious, yes, but people had become complacent. People had become, well, they had, were sort of going through the motions in terms of their faith. They went to church because they had to go to church. And, and so during this time, there was this better understanding of, greater understanding of, really the, the why behind everything that they were doing. And so we call this a revival. You can see in the picture here, you know, this line of people going into a church. I'm not sure the last time you ever saw a line like this going into a church. But it sort of gives you an idea that during this time, this is what happened to churches. During this time, there were more people who were, who were eager to, um, to, to go into church and to hear about um, what their relationship with God was supposed to be like in the eyes of the Great Awakening preachers. So what caused it? Well, there are several things that cause the, the Great Awakening. And you can see those things over here on this side of the screen. We've got people were too focused on certain things. People began to reject the Church of England. And then we have at the bottom here the Age of Reason. And so we're going to look at each, each of these things. So again, three big ideas. People were too focused on. People began to sort of reject or object to the Anglican Church and then the Age of Reason. At the time in the colonies, from the very founding of the colonies up until the 1730s and 40s, there was an overemphasis on wealth. People were focused on making money. Now granted, it may not have been wealth in the same sense that we understand it. But they had to get enough money in order to survive. They had to find a way to provide for themselves to make sure that their family stayed safe. And the result was that they spent most of their waking time, whether they were a farmer or a merchant, concerned about how much money they had, whether or not their family was going to survive, whether or not their family was going to be safe. And this was all about providing for their family. This was their focus. 
It was not church. It was not God. It was not their relationship with God or their understanding of who God was and what he wanted of them. And why was this? This is something that I don't think a lot of people really appreciate about the time and the age we live in. One of the things that we know from, even from the early 1900s, but going back in time to the early 1600s, that the number of people that died in a family was much greater than what we see today. And that sounds strange. I mean, there's more people today. But the idea is this, that when, when my children were born, I didn't have any concerns that they were going to die, and I still don't have any concerns, that they were going to die before I do. And I didn't have any concerns that when I, my wife got pregnant three times and we had three children, that I was going to end up only having one or no children by the time that the oldest was 10 or 11 years old. I know these all sound strange to us, but see, the average person in the early 1700s fully expected that half their children were not going to survive them that half their children would die in the process of childbirth or shortly thereafter. And then you're wondering, well, well why didn't the parents? Why, why wouldn't the parents die? Well, they were then that lucky half that survived. And as a result, their bodies grew strong and their immunities built up. And the result is here they are at 30 years old and they're having children and their children don't have those things yet. And so we look at a lot of the people of that time and they would have six, seven, eight kids. And it wasn't just because, well, they like having kids. They weren't trying to create a workforce. They were trying to hedge their bets. They were going to end up losing a lot of their children in the process. And a lot of women died in the process of giving birth as well. And so a lot of men ended up raising families and or, get, and, or getting remarried in order to raise those families. This was the sad reality for people at the time. And the result is you can see why they become focused on safety and survival and providing for their families. This is something that they've got to be constantly concerned about. Now, in addition to that, there is the rejection of the Anglican Church or the Church of England. And the main reason for that is because the Church of England is, in fact, a government church. In the colonies, the Church of England has been planted over time as people moved from England into the colonies, they brought with them this understanding of the Anglican Church. Now we see probably the, the least influence of the Anglican Church in the New England colonies where the Puritans were the primary force. But when you start hitting colonies like New York and you get down into the middle and southern colonies, the Anglican Church becomes very powerful. And it is a government church. And what that means is that when people give to church, that money goes to the government. They didn't see this as providing for the church and the church was then doing good things with this money. They saw this, in fact, as, well, as basically paying taxes. This is what they were expected to do. And they understood that it went to the, to the government in some sense, whether it was a colonial government or it went back into England where it went into directly into the king's treasury. The other part of the Anglican church that was really a problem for many of the people that live in the colonies is that their access to the Bible was restricted. In the Anglican church, typically, there was a Bible. One Bible for the minister. Back in England, those Bibles were typically chained to the pulpit, so you couldn't even walk away with them if you were the minister. And the Bibles were then restricted in terms of being in people's hands. And because there were no printing presses in the, in the colonies that could print books until probably around this time or a little bit later, the result was that people didn't have personal Bibles unless they bought them from England, and then, of course, they were very expensive. And so access to Bibles was restricted in some sense, because in the Anglican Church, they weren't providing them, they weren't encouraging them, they weren't printing them in the colonies and making them cheap. And that was all because they wanted to make sure that the ministers had an understanding of things, but they didn't want the people to have this, sort of the same view. They didn't want the people to be able to look into the, the Bible and see what the Bible says on their own. They wanted the people to listen to the minister and his interpretation of what the Bible said. In the Anglican Church, there is more of an emphasis on rituals than there is on religious principles. We come to church on Sunday, we do these things at church on Sunday, and then we leave. 
and everyone's supposed to show up and everyone's supposed to go through this process and then they go home. And so this becomes more of a, of a habit of some uh, basically going through the motions on Sunday because you have to, because you're told to, because socially it's, it's acceptable and to not to might mean that you're punished in some way. You might be punished socially, you might be punished physically, depending on the community you live in, depending on what you've done. But the Anglican Church has this grip on society that a lot of people during the Great Awakening begin to reject. They begin to recognize on their own. They begin to recognize because of the Great Awakening ministers that this is not the way things are supposed to be. That this is not the way church is supposed to be. That a relationship with God is not one where a church dictates and takes your money and restricts your access to understanding who God is. That's not what a good relationship looks like. Now, on top of all that, this, this time period, the 1730s and 40s, is sort of the midst of, the middle of, this thing called the Age of Reason, which some people might call the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment was something that was instrumental in many, many, many respects. But when it came to the spiritual aspect of things, the Age of Reason or the Enlightenment was somewhat damaging to, to people's, um, to the churches and to people's understanding of, of what is those things that were spiritual. The Age of Reason was basically a rejection of the religious explanation of those things in life. There was more of a, an understanding that science should answer those questions, but not religion. And so because of the Age of Reason, because that time period had this overemphasis on sort of a rejection of, of religion as an answer to questions and, a, and really looking at the data, looking at the science, looking at the, the, um, the scientific explanation of things, that we should focus on those things. Again, people began to reject that and began to focus more on spiritual things. But they didn't go to the Church of England to focus on those things because the church was something that went through religious rituals but not focusing on any kind of religious principles. The people at the time were stuck in a non-spiritual focus. They were, however, at the time, spiritually hungry. They wanted answers to questions, but they didn't know where to go. They saw the, the community and the ideas and the, and the world around them as, as rejecting things that were spiritual. And that's not, that didn't make them feel good about their relationship with God. And so in the 1730s and 40s, there is this realization, again, this awakening that is going to be formational for the colonies. And it starts in England and it comes over to the colonies in the form of a man named George Whitfield. George Whitfield comes to the colonies and as a, as a new light minister, meaning basically that he has a, a new way of looking at religion, not like the Anglican Church, that George Whitfield begins to present those ideas in the colonies. And then another man by the name of Jonathan Edwards, who is, lives in the colonies, begins to follow sort of in Whitfield's steps and begins to uh, reiterate those ideas. But this new light way of thinking of things is something that rejects those old traditional ideas of the Anglican Church. And this rejection is something that runs very deep. These two guys, because they're basically preaching against the Anglican Church and preaching against that complacency and that that those spiritual kind of rituals, these two guys aren't welcome in churches. They're not asked to come into Anglican churches and do their speaking. They have to go from, from community to community, and they're going to speak on people's farms, they're going to speak in barns, they're going to speak at open sort of amphitheaters, and they're going to begin preaching as they travel from place to place, and that's what it means to be itinerant, is that they traveled from place to place preaching. But what they're preaching is really kind of a new way of looking at, at God a new way of understanding religion, a different way of, of practicing those spiritual precepts that you believe so fully in. So what was the, 
what was the message they were communicating? Here it says their sermon, um, meaning when they spoke in church, what, was the, what were the ideas that they were promoting? And one of the things that they point out during the, the Great Awakening, and this gets back to um, really kind of fundamentals of the Christian faith, is that this person, Jesus, who Christians believe was, was the Christ, died upon the cross for all people to save them from their sins, that's where these two men begin to focus their attention. Wait a minute, saved us from our sins? What, what, the, what does that mean exactly? And what they pointed out to the people of, of the colonies at that time was that all people have sinned. There's nobody, they say, that has escaped this idea of sin. Even those who love God and even those who believe in Jesus have sinned. In other words, nobody's perfect. And what they begin to remind the people about is that if, in fact, you are that person and you're living in that sin and you're continuing to do that sin, how could you ever expect to get to heaven? And so during the Great Awakening, this focus on the idea that all people are sort of equal in God's eyes, we've all fallen short, that the result is that you are all going to go to hell. And so Jonathan Edwards is very famous for a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. The idea that God is a judge and God will look at all people and see the things that they have done and at that point determine whether or not they get to go to heaven or they have to live an eternity in hell. And the main point here is that people suddenly realized that it wasn't about the church that they attended, that it wasn't about the rituals that they did. What was more important is their relationship with God. They had to get right with God in order to be saved from the fire of hell. This is the main point of, of the Great Awakening. But what's interesting is from that idea and from those, that message that was given by these ministers, things begin to change in the colonies. Now, Ben Franklin's on the screen here for one particular reason. Most people think of Ben Franklin as, well, at best, he's probably considered a skeptic. Um, most people think of him as um, at least an agnostic, if not an atheist. The reality is that Ben Franklin comes from a, a background. His, his father was a minister, and uh, he himself, a person that believes, but not in a way that was, um, I think, made very public. He didn't talk about it very often. But he is so moved by George Whitfield and his preaching. He is so moved by the message that is given that Ben Franklin is take, going to take money out of his own pocket and he's going to encourage the people of Philadelphia that have money to pour money into building a very large church in Philadelphia that is meant for anybody and any minister that would like to use it. In other words, it's not a denominational church. It's not an Anglican church but it is for any minister to use. He wants to give a place for George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards to do their work. He wants to give them an opportunity to be indoors. And so he builds one of the largest churches in the colonies with his money as well as the money of others because of how much he was impacted by these two men. In addition to that, the colonies are going to change because new schools are going to be built. As time goes on, and we, we know that there's you know, a greater need. We can't just get along with these two ministers doing this work, but we need more people to do the work of these two ministers. We're going to build schools to train ministers. And Princeton was one of those schools that was, was built at the time that was a school for ministers. Um, most people don't realize that Harvard and Yale and Princeton, these were schools that were not originally built to be just four-year colleges to train people to be lawyers or doctors, but they were in fact built to train ministers um, they are seminary schools from the very beginning, although they aren't now. And so what, what is the old light? Well, the old light is the old ideas. The old light is, in fact, the, the Anglican church. The old light is the old way of doing things. It's the rituals instead of relationship. And the new light ministers are promoting something very different, and society is changing as a result. And so what are the effects of the Great Awakening? The Great Awakening is going to have 
two major sort of groups of effects, different ways of thinking about things and different ways of behaving. It's going to change the way people think about things as well as going to change the way that people act. People begin to simplify their beliefs. They begin to look at their, their faith in God as something that's rather simple. A belief in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Done. It is not something that's complicated. It's not you get to heaven because you believe those things and because you do X, Y, and Z, but it's simply because of that belief. A personal relationship with God. There's going to be a greater understanding acceptance of the idea of freedom of conscience. That is, each person has that relationship with God. Each person is developing an understanding of right and wrong based on what they understand God wants them to do. And as a result, they have this conscience that's built into them. Now that conscience is there from day one, but that conscience needs to be exercised and developed. And during the Great Awakening, there's a lot of exercise and development. But the result is that they begin to understand that, that my conscience may not be like your conscience. That I have the freedom to develop, have my conscience developed in a different way than yours. And as a result, I may not come to the same conclusions about things. I might think that, for instance, you know, I, I, there's only one kind of way that you should ever eat meat. And that is if it's raised in a certain way or in a certain place. And, and that's the only way and that's the right way to do it. And to do it any other way is, is offensive to God. And if that's what you, you know, if that's what I want to believe, then fine. And if you don't want to believe it, that's fine too. And that's what we mean by freedom of conscience. At the same time, because we have freedom of conscience, and, and I might have one way of seeing things and you might have another way, that there's an equality before God that we all have. And that equality doesn't exist just because we have freedom of conscience. It exists more so because we're all sinners in the eyes of God, according to the Great Awakening Ministers. That we've all done something wrong. And granted, you may have done things different than me, and I may have done things worse than you, but we've all done things that are wrong one way or the other. And in that sense, we are all equal before God. But there's also this understanding that we need to reduce government control when it comes to religion. That there needs to be a separation of the church and state. And this does not mean that religion or the church gets out of, in any way, influencing the state, but more so that we need to get the government out of the church. That when the government controls the church, there is no freedom of conscience. When the government controls, controls the church, very often the beliefs are no longer simple. They're very complicated, as government likes to make things more complicated, not less. And so reducing government control of religion is something that happens during the Great Awakening and this belief that church needs to be simple and that relationship with God needs to be personal. And if it's kept personal and, and the government stays out of it, then these other parts of, of our faith will be um, e easily put in place. Now, the new ways of, of behaving include the following. There's a greater sense of unity because we all recognize that everyone's equal in the eyes of God. There's no reason to be divided. And the result is there's greater unity among the colonies. There's a willingness to challenge authority. People that walked out of the Anglican church and walked, walked into those, if you want to call them churches, and walked into those services that were run by the Great Awakening ministers, they had to have a willingness to walk out of that church in the first place. They had to have a willingness to say no to the Anglican church, to say no to what the government church said they had to do. And that took a lot of courage, recognizing that there could be social consequences, or worse, for doing that. But people still did it anyways. There is increased religious tolerance. Again, because of the idea of freedom of conscience, there's an understanding that people may not practice or believe the same things exactly the way that I do. But we should be tolerant of their freedom of conscience as much as we expect them to be tolerant of ours. And of course, what comes out of the, the Great Awakening is a greater desire to obey God but at the same time, a willingness to interpret the Bible independently and to develop that freedom of conscience. These are major changes in the colonies. 
the idea that the government should be out of religion, the idea that there's this freedom and independence when it comes to our faith. The idea that we need to be tolerant of people that disagree with us when it comes to our faith because we each have our own personal relationship with God. That there can't be one overarching relationship that the government dictates to us that says it should all be the same way. And so in this way, the Great Awakening really is a, a long-term cause of the American Revolution. It's something that changes the character of the colonies. It's something that changes the society of the colonies. That what is considered normal now is not the same thing that was normal before the Great Awakening. And that people now are willing to think for themselves rather than be told what to think. And the result is that when it comes time to break away from England, they're going to develop their own ideas. They're going to look at their situation and they're going to, to go through the, the, the causes, those things, that, those situations that are affecting them and on their own determine if there's enough reason to break away from England. They've got that willingness to challenge authority. But they also don't think that they have to be told what to do. They understand that they can independently make these decisions. And in this way, the Great Awakening was foundational. It was this formative moment in the colonies that gave them what they needed in order to go through the revolution.